Thank you, youth band. You may be seated. Good morning and welcome. Thank you for joining us today, either here in the building or electronically. My name is Jim Byler, and I'm one of the volunteers here at Trinity. If you're new today or it's been a long time, we invite you to share your contact information with us, either uh, on the uh, card in the pew rack in front of you. I'm getting a lot of feedback. Um, you can place that in the collection plate as it passed or leave it at the Welcome Center in the foyer. Uh, and if you can, join us in the foyer afterwards for a time of coffee and connections. And just so that you know, we're here for you. No matter where you are on your walk with Jesus, even if you're not on a walk with him. The service today will probably conclude around noon or a little bit after. We will stand at times, but feel free to stay seated if it's more convenient for you. And if you're not a regular attender here, you can ignore the offering as it goes by. That's our responsibility. There's a lot going on here at Trinity besides what happens on Sunday morning. Most of you probably received the email rooted together. There are also usually a few printed copies on the, the, at the Welcome Center. You can also download or read online uh, from the uh, Trinity website at trinitybolton.org. A little statistic for you. Of the four things that cause people to come to church, what do you think is the most highly rated? Perhaps you've guessed. 86% come from an invitation from a friend. So out of 100, that doesn't leave much, does it? The next nearest is 6%. So invite someone to come with you next week, a neighbor, a friend, a coworker. Today, Pastor David continues the series, Developing a Faith That Works. It's from James, one of the 66 books in the library of books we call the Bible. James, the author, was half-brother of Jesus, and he was a late follower. How would you feel if your brother claimed to be the Messiah? Skeptical? Scornful? Is your brother delusional or maybe a lunatic? I'd have to say I'm pretty sure I might have agreed with him. Maybe that's where you are today. But to his and everyone's surprise and astonishment, completely shocked, Jesus appeared three days later following his certain death by crucifixion. James, the author, turned from critic, mocker, skeptic, to believer, to a Jesus follower. He concluded, as many of us have, paraphrasing from someone else, anyone who can predict his own death and resurrection and pull it off, well, I'm compelled to believe in him. Today's teaching from the book of James has the somewhat startling title, The Impending Judgment of the Oppressive Rich. Listen carefully to see who James was talking about. The youth band will now continue to lead us in worship. Worship. Psalm 92. It is good to give thanks to the Lord and to sing praises to your name, O Most High, to declare your loving kindness in the morning and your faithfulness by night, with the ten string lute and with the harp, with resounding music upon the lyre. For you, O Lord, have made me glad by what you have done. I will sing for joy at the work of your hands. Breath in my lungs, I will praise you. 
faithfulness and how he is always with us no matter where we are or no matter what life holds. 1 Thessalonians 5.24 says, the one who called you is faithful and will do what he promised. Joshua 1.9 says, have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged for the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. Treasure. 
much for this amazing day that you've given us, or even us local. And I ask that you would just be in, like, let us be in your presence today, Lord. Let us remember that you are faithful, that you are faithful to me. And even when we are in the dark, Lord, and we can't see the light at the end of the tunnel, help us to just know that you are there that you are walking with us, that you are beside us, that you are holding us up, that you are carrying us, Lord. And I thank you so much for how faithful you are, Lord. Um, please open our hearts for to hear the message that Pastor Smith has for us today, and I ask that we would apply it to our week and our lives, Lord. And I thank you so much for all that you've done for us. Amen. So great to see you all. All those that were on the youth retreat last week up in Monadnock, we're praying for you and uh, welcome back. Uh, we understand that four of you uh, prayed to receive Christ as your Lord and Savior for the first time and uh, about uh, 10 or so rededicated their lives to Christ. So we have uh, four roses plus another person from Trinity uh, accepted Christ this week. So we have five roses commemorate God's saving grace alive in people's lives. So that's awesome. So if you pray to receive the Lord in your life, let me know. And I'll certainly put a rose in the, here and talk with you and pray with you, help you to get started growing in your walk with Jesus. Well, let's pray together. Heavenly Father, thank you for this day. Thank you that we can worship you in this place. Thank you for the people, the friends that uh, we have, and the new friends that we're meeting. We thank you that we can gather here to worship you with song, in prayer, in the reading of uh, your word, and in the preaching of your word. We also thank you for a special testimony that we have coming up later in the service with Carlton Smith. We look forward to hearing a slice of uh, his testimony of how you've been working in his life to the glory of your great name. We also thank you for those that will be joining the church today in church membership. So we pray your blessing upon that part of our service. Father, as the scriptures, you teach us to weep with those that weep and rejoice with those that, we, that rejoice. And Father, as we rejoice over uh, these five people that have come to faith in Christ, we're reminded uh, that the, all the angels of heaven rejoice over one person who repents of their sin and comes to know Jesus as their Messiah, their Lord and their God. And Father, we rejoice together on these five lives, these five decisions for you, and we pray you'd help them to grow in grace as well as being saved by your grace. We also pray for Dave Carroll as his uh, beloved sister, uh, Joanne, has died uh, and has gone home to be with you. So we pray for him in his mourning of her passing, but also in the celebration that she is, as a Christian, is at home with you in heaven. So we pray your blessing upon the services done in Louisiana uh, this week. And pray, Father, for Dave and for his brothers and sisters. And now Dave, as the, the oldest surviving sibling, becomes uh, the patriarch, as it were, of his family. So we pray, Lord, your blessing there in the name of Jesus. We also pray 
for, uh, for those that are visiting with us today and considering whether this would be the new church home that they will start attending. Lord, speak to their hearts. May they say and know that this is your calling for them, that they could come and hear the word of God preached and worship you and, and grow together with this body of believers here in Bolton. Father, make that clear to them if this is the place of your calling. And we thank you for their attendance here with us. Father, thank you for your blessing upon our 8 o'clock service this morning and for those that receive your word and the visitors that attended there. We give you thanks and pray that you would bless the rest of their day also. Father, as we lay before you our prayers, we ask that you would hear us as we pray together now the Lord's Prayer saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come. Well, uh, at this time, I'd like to introduce Carlton Smith, who's going to share with us uh, a little testimony. And uh, when was it? Was it a year, year and a half that you and Jennifer got married here in April, something like that? A year and eight months. year and eight months. Well, Jennifer and Carlton, it's great that you got married and you settled in, and now you're sharing a testimony. So come up and and come up and so let's welcome Carlton to the pulpit today and thank you very much. C.S. Lewis observed all that not is eternal is eternally useless that speaks to our focus doesn't it if something is not eternal then it is useless eternally the Lord saved me in 1990, and since then, Christ's work in my life is immeasurable. I couldn't possibly share it all in a few minutes. For example, this is where I recited my vows to Jennifer, my wife. That miracle is a slice that would take up the rest of my time. <laughs> I'm here this morning because one Sunday this past fall, the pastor and I chatted for a moment after a sermon, and I commented to him about a question he posed as part of his message. He asked us, what would you do if you lost everything? He said, I mean, if you really lost it all. The pastor said that in a way that really struck me because sitting there, I immediately thought, I'm probably the only person in here that that's happened to. And I shared that with him. So the pastor, in his inimitable way, <laughs> paused while smiling and said, you know, Carlton, Maybe you could share your testimony. Yeah, at that point, unless you're leaving the country for an extended stay, the, the answer is yes. So here I am. I was raised Protestant, and I usually attended church. If you asked me questions about my faith or religion, I'd have likely guessed. If it was in the form of a multiple choice, I'd probably have chosen correctly. If you asked me something serious, for example, who or what the Holy Spirit was, I probably would have stared at you and then resolved, well, that's probably a question for a pastor. I wasn't born again. I confessed my sinful ways and asked Jesus Christ into my heart on April 6th, 1990. It was a Friday at 11.45 a.m., in fact. Another slice, and it would take the rest of my time to talk about it, but thank you, Lord. I could only wish one thing about being born again, that I had done it sooner. Why not? So my journey is upwards of 30 years into eternity. First I lived at college, then I transferred and worked, managing two motels. I not only paid tuition, I earned enough money to drive the car of my dreams at the time, a 320i BMW. Earning income, saving money, driving the car of my choice was all important to me. And it remained so after college and through the years. I earned a CPA license, became a tax practitioner, 
was a licensed investment broker, attended graduate school for computer science, and mostly worked as a management consultant. Proverbs instructs us, labor not to be rich, cease from thine own wisdom. Paul teaches from Colossians, whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord, not for men, since you know that you will receive an inheritance from the Lord as a reward. It is the Lord Christ you are serving. Yet, at one point, I did lose it all. Not some, not most. In fact, I lost it all, and then some. I've studied certain US history, for example, the Vietnam War. No matter how much I read, though, it'll never make me a Vietnam veteran. I wasn't in that war. I didn't fight under those circumstances. And I was too young, by the way. <laughs> but I can come to genuinely appreciate it. When I lost it all, I was a Christian. A Christian, and I lost it all. That's not supposed to happen to Christians, or at least I didn't think so. In Acts, Peter said to someone, silver and gold have I none, but such as I have give I thee. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. What did Peter have? Proverbs tells us, there is that maketh himself rich, yet hath nothing. There is that that maketh himself poor, yet hath great riches. A confluence of decisions, bad ones, resulted in losing it all overnight. Now, actually, it took about four years. And it was another four years after that before I began to rebuild. It was beyond devastating. It was beyond devastating for me. I am that war veteran. Only if you've experienced it can you truly appreciate it. It's frightening, and it'll force you to question everything. During a long walk near my country home, I prayed, and I prayed wrenchingly, and I let God know that this was so difficult, so inconceivable, that I really needed to figure out my faith. Was I going to remain a believer? Eventually, I cried and knew without a doubt that I would indeed remain a believer. In true casino parlance, I chose to double down. Piling up riches is not about being smart. It has nothing to do with it. Paul said, let no man deceive himself. If any man among you seemeth to be wise in this world, let him become a fool that he may be wise. Yes, to be a fool for Christ. In Corinthians, Paul teaches and mostly admonishes, we are fools for Christ's sake, but ye are wise in Christ. We are weak, but ye are strong. Ye are honorable, but we are despised. He addressed the puffery or arrogance that can accompany spiritual prosperity. An Amish church leader once said, prosperity has often been fatal to Christianity, but persecution never. And it's true, because piling up riches is about one thing, where we put our trust. I've learned something. I cannot be content in all things if I have fear in anything. Trust and fear. We're all familiar with what Matthew said, for where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. No man can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. A boyhood chum came from an exceptionally intelligent family, doctors, scientists, mostly Ivy League. The friend earned millions and millions at one point, and he lost it all, multiple bankruptcies, and he is yet to rebound. Our own president has filed bankruptcy a few times. Speaking of bankruptcy, part of being a fool for Christ was listening to him when he said to me, bankruptcy was not an option. Amen. Because people said I was a fool, but they didn't know it was for Christ. Proverbs reveals, my fruit is better than gold, yea, than fine gold, and my revenue, I like that word used in the King James, and my revenue than choice silver. God's revenue. What is God's revenue? Unless and until we know what God's revenue is, we will never be rich. I'm rich, and I don't say that to brag, but I'll never run out of money. God's revenue is like the living water that he offers. It will never run out. 
With man, revenue was finite and fleeting. In order to gain my life, I had to lose it. Although I was a Christian, I had to lose my riches to gain God's revenue. God's revenue is wisdom. Proverbs asks, how much better is it to get wisdom than gold? Michelangelo carved an incomparable statue of David. It stands about 18 feet. The story goes that Michelangelo chose a discarded hunk of stone for his work. When asked why he chose that stone for such an amazing carving, he said, I didn't carve David. I saw him inside that rock and used my tools to release him. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. When we are born again, we often assume that we change into something. God has a different way. He chisels us out of the old because he sees the new. He chisels us out of the old I may have, and, I, and because he sees the new. I may have lost it all, but he released me from the old. Unlike my unsaved friend, he lost it all, and he's still waiting to rebound. He needs to be released. With men, this is impossible. But with God, all things are possible. I welcome God's chisel as he releases what he sees. When we are released, we are no longer imprisoned. I lost it all, and now I'm released. And I'm no longer imprisoned by riches. Thank you, Lord, and thank you. Scripture I'd like to read from Malachi is Malachi chapter 3. I, the Lord, do not change, so you, O descendants of Jacob, are not destroyed. Ever since the time of your forefathers, you have turned away from my decrees and have not kept them. Return to me, and I will return to you, says the Lord Almighty. But you ask, how are we to return? Will a man rob God, yet you rob me? But you ask, how do we rob you? in tithes and offerings. You're under a curse, the whole nation of you, because you're robbing me. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house. Test me in this, says the Lord Almighty. See if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven, pour out so much blessing that you will not have room enough for it. Let's now give to the Lord. So one of the beautiful things that God has done for us in the gift of the church is the chance to rehearse his goodness back to one another. That's what we just heard Carlton do, um, and that's what I want to do here too. This song is responsive, um, so I'll sing a line, and then I would like you guys to respond. For example, do you feel the world is broken? We do, etc. You'll pick it up. Do you feel the world is broken? We do. Do you feel the shadows deepen? We do. But do you know that all the dark won't stop the light from getting through? We do. And do you wish that you could see it all made? Is anyone holy? Is any 
anyone able to break the seal and open the scroll? The Lion of Judah, who conquered the grave. He is David's root and the Lamb who died to ransom the slave. Is he worthy? Is he worthy? of our blessing and honor and glory is he worthy of this he is and does the father truly love us he does and does the spirit move among us he does and does jesus our messiah hold forever those he loves he does and does our god intend to dwell again with us he does Is anyone worthy? Oh, is anyone holy? Is there anyone able to break the seal and open the scroll? The Lion of Judah, who conquered the grave. He is David's root and the Lamb who died to ransom the slave. From every people and tribe, from every nation and tongue, he has made us kings and priests to God to reign with his son. Is he worthy? Is he worthy of our blessing and honor and glory? Is he worthy? Is he worthy? Is he worthy of this? He is. Is he worthy? Is he worthy? Thank you for this beautiful sunny day. Thank you for this, for this community. And thank you for everything you have given to us. With this offering, we return to you just a small portion of that. We pray that it's used wisely for the support of this church, for the local community, and for your missions around the world. And this we pray in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Our children are dismissed for kinder time and children's time. And at this time, we invite uh, Jonathan and Rebecca Blumhofer to come forward along with Shana Dietrich uh, and our elders for receiving of new members.
Hey guys, you can stand right here next to Shana. This is Jonathan, this is Shana. Hi there. Wow, pretty exciting stuff, huh? Awesome. All right, so we'll get our elders in their respective spots. And uh, Jim Byler, come up here next to me, if you would, please. Looks great. Well, welcome. It's good to have you here. And everyone's healthy today? Or at least, uh, sort of? Yeah, OK, great. Good. <laughs> I'm sort of healthy, too. So it's good, good to have you here. Well, at this time, um, I'd like to uh, just share a little bit about um, membership and kind of what the, the, the benefits are. We went over this together, but for the benefit of everyone else here that maybe didn't meet with me, um, there's really three parts of the Christian life, and there are three Bs, all right? Uh, believing is the first part. The Bible says, believe in the Lord Jesus and you'll be saved. So that's the first prerequisite. I ask you, do you have you believed in Jesus Christ? Have you accepted him into your heart by faith? Uh, the second part is belonging. Not only that you're called to believe in Christ, but you're to belong together to a community, a community of believers uh, like, like Trinity, where you can grow in your faith and be encouraged and get to use your gifts, and we get to use our gifts, and together we can advance God's kingdom. And then the third part is becoming. And what we're becoming is becoming more like Jesus, conforming us into his character. And uh, that we, it's a big theological word is sanctification that we're going on. And that process takes place uh, through many things, but one of the catalysts that God uses is the body of Christ to spur us on uh, to, to become more like Christ. So the benefits of membership is to, it identifies you as a genuine believer because I will ask you some questions. Secondly, it provides a spiritual family to encourage me in my faith, gives me a place to discover and use my spiritual gifts, place me under the spiritual protection of godly leaders. Well, here's some of the godly leaders right here, some of the elders. And uh, you'll be assigned a, an elder who will work with you and pray with you and uh, along with myself and Pastor Eric can help, help you grow in your faith. And so uh, if you'll find out before today who that is, one of these guys, and they'll let you know. In fact, uh, who's the Bloomhoffers? That, that, would, that would be you, Joe. All right, the, the, we'll make that connection. And how about for Shana? Who is the uh, elder for Shana? All right, come on, guys. Who? Okay. All right. Mark, you're it. All right. All right. Mark is going to be your elder, and if there's a problem with that, let me know, and we'll we'll reassign. How's that? How's that? Well, a couple questions for you. Uh, first of all, do you give yourself to his his service and take Trinity Church to be your church? Do you promise to walk together with your fellow members in faithfulness and in Christian love? Do you commit yourself to attend the services of the church and observe its ordinances? And do you, do you endeavor to share in its work and support and through your prayers, exercising of your spiritual gifts, help to make it a more fruitful body of Christians? If so, answer, I do. The second one is, uh, have you received Jesus Christ into your heart by faith? to be your Lord and your Savior? Do you seek to follow him all your days in obedience to his will and call upon your life as his disciple? In accordance with his holy word, do you strive to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength? And do you seek to love your neighbor as yourself? If so, answer, I do. At this time, we'll join together in the church covenant, and that's in your, in your bulletins, and I invite all the members to join together as we reaffirm our covenant together. All right. We covenant with the Lord and with one another do bind ourselves in the presence of God to walk together in his holy ways. We will strive to be doers of the word and not hearers. 
service only, to be firm in faith, quickened in hope, and constant in love, that we will consecrate our time, talent, substance, and influence as heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. At this time, uh, Pastor Eric will give a, a prayer, a blessing upon the three of you. I'm not Mike, so I'll try to pray loud. <laughs> Father God, Abba, we come into your presence and we're so grateful for the work that you're doing in our church family. We thank you for adding to our numbers and not just adding to our numbers, but the gifts they will bring. We know that you're bringing them into our presence because there are areas in our church body that need their gifts and need what you're doing in their lives to be revealed in the body, Lord. So we pray that you give them courage. We pray that you give them boldness. We pray that you give them a sense of purpose here, Lord, that they would benefit us and we would benefit them, Jesus, as we yield ourselves fully to you. We thank you that you are the one who binds us, to bind us together, and Lord, may we not give up on meeting together. Lord, may we continue to pursue you. May we hold unswervingly to the faith we profess. We are so grateful for the work you've done in Jesus Christ, and that it's you who unite us based upon grace as we seek to live in response to that grace. Lord, we thank you for these new members. And we pray that you continue to use them in their lives. And Lord, we pray that you grow our body strong. It's your name we pray. Amen. 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 Well, Mark will start by giving the right hand of fellowship or hug. And we welcome you into the church and then we'll all follow him. The Old Testament reading is Amos chapter 8, verses 1 through 10, and in the Pew Bible, it's page 1429. This is what the Sovereign Lord showed me, a basket of ripe fruit. What do you see, Amos? He asked. A basket of ripe fruit, I answered. Then the Lord said to me, the time is ripe for my people Israel. I will spare them no longer. In that day, declares the Sovereign Lord, the songs in the temple will turn to wailing. Many, many bodies flung everywhere. Silence. Hear this, you who trample the needy, and do away with the poor of the land, saying, when will the new moon be over that we may sell grain, and the Sabbath be ended that we may market wheat, skimping the measure, boosting the price, and cheating with dishonest scales, buying the poor with silver and the needy for a pair of sandals, selling even the sweepings with the wheat. The Lord has sworn by the pride of Jacob, I will never forget anything they have done. Will not the land tremble for this and all who live in it mourn? The whole land will rise up like the Nile. It will be stirred up and then sink like the river of Egypt. In that day, declares the sovereign Lord, I will make the sun go down at noon and darken the earth in broad daylight. I will turn your religious feasts into mourning and all your singing into weeping. I will make all of you wear sackcloth and shave your heads. I will make that time like mourning for an only son and the end of it like a bitter day. The gospel reading is Matthew 24, 30 to 32. And just a little context the disciples have asked Jesus what it will be like when he returns, when the second coming will be. And this is part of Jesus' response to that question. At that time, the, Son of Man, the sign of the Son of Man will appear in the sky, and all the nations of the earth will mourn. 
They will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of the sky with power and great glory. And he will send his angels with a loud trumpet call, and they will gather his elect from the four winds, from the uh, one end of the heavens to the other. Now learn this lesson from the fig tree. As soon as its twigs get tender and its leaves come out, you know that summer is near. Even so, when you see all these things, you know that it is near, right at the door. I tell you the truth, this generation will certainly not pass away until all these things have happened. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. No one knows about that day or hour, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. As it was in the days of Noah, so it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. For in the days before the flood, people were eating and drinking and marrying and giving in marriage up to the day Noah entered the ark, and they knew nothing about what would happen until the flood came and took them all away. That is how it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. Two men will be in the field. One will be taken, the other left. Two women will be grinding with a hand mill. One will be taken, the other left. Therefore, keep watch, because you do not know what day the Lord, your Lord will come. And our New Testament reading is James chapter 5, verses 1 through 9. Now listen, you rich, rich people, weep and wail because of the misery that is coming upon you. Your wealth has rotted, and moths have eaten your clothes. Your gold and silver are corroded. Their corrosion will testify against you and eat your flesh like fire. You have hoarded wealth in the last days. Look, the wages you failed to pay the workmen who mowed your fields are crying out against you. The cries of the harvesters have reached the ears of the Lord Almighty. You have lived on earth in luxury and self-indulgence. You have fattened yourselves in the day of slaughter. You have condemned and murdered innocent men who were not opposing you. Be patient then, brothers, until the Lord's coming. See how the farmer waits for the land to yield its valuable crop and how patient he is for the autumn and spring rains. You too, be patient and stand firm because the Lord's coming is near. Don't grumble against each other, brothers, or you will be judged. The judge is standing at the door. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God for his holy and inspired word. Well, uh, our sermon uh, today is the impending judgment on the oppressive rich, and it's taken from uh, Luke's, uh, taken from James' uh, epistle, chapter 5, 1 to 9, and uh, there's an outline for you on page 6 to help you to follow along, and uh, it's, it's not a warm and fuzzy message for you today, um, but it is God's word and I don't apologize for it. Uh, but certainly it, it takes a great understanding uh, to not take this and to apply it wrongly or to draw the wrong conclusions from it. And so we will go through it uh, verse by verse and uh, trust that God will bless us as he always does. But let's pray before we begin. Heavenly and Holy Father, thank you for the inspiration of all Scripture, including the epistle of James. Help us now as we tackle these uh, challenging verses. Help us not to duck, but to certainly embrace and uh, where there's change that needs to take place in our life. Give us the courage to change. And Lord, uh, we pray that your word would take root in our lives, that we would bear fruit in our lives, and to the glory of your great name. So bless now the preaching of your word uh, through the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, we are in a study of the book of James, and we've entitled this series, Developing a Faith that Works. 
Because that's at the core of this book, is that you're saved by God's grace through faith, but it's not a faith that stands alone. But it's a faith that shows itself genuine by the good works that we do in our life. And therefore, the question is, uh, what kind of evidence is there for you that you are a Christ follower? Or what are the works that are coming forth in your life if you decided to follow Jesus? Well, in an overview of James, we've embarked on this spiritual journey through this letter. Who is James? Well, James was the brother of Jesus, the half-brother of Jesus. And uh, uh, James was the, uh, at first, looked at Jesus as his brother and thought that he was crazy because he just didn't have the understanding of who Jesus really was. And so it wasn't until after the resurrection that Jesus uh, appeared to him that he then believed that Jesus is the very Son of God and embraced him not only as his uh, half-brother but as his God and his Lord. Uh, And so he went on to become the head of the church in Jerusalem in the first century, and he wrote this book called the the Epistle of James. Well, in today's message, uh, there's a scathing and stinging warning to the rich of the soon coming day of judgment for their sins. And the one who is returning again is Jesus Christ, the Son of God, the judge who's standing at the door ready to judge them. Well, this message uh, as a rebuke against the rich is a two-part message given by James. We'll look at part of it today and part of it next week. And, and there's prophetical woes of judgment upon the rich because they, they have been, uh, and those who have been victimized and oppressed by the rich, Uh, He goes into how are they to respond to that, uh, to stand against injustice by adopting a posture of patience and and perseverance and not to grumble and to also be looking towards the return of Jesus Christ who will deliver them and who will reign uh, over this world. Now, before we draw the wrong conclusion here from this, uh, James' view about the rich, Uh, More importantly, God's view of the rich. Let's turn to 1 Timothy chapter 6. Paul says this, and certainly James would concur, as for the rich in this present age, speaking to rich believers now, charge them to not be haughty, nor to set their hopes on the uncertainty of riches, but on God, who richly provides us with everything to enjoy. They are to do good. They are to be rich in good works, to be generous, ready to share. The storing up treasure for themselves is a good foundation for the future, so that they may take hold of that which is truly life. You notice here he doesn't say, if you want to be a follower of Jesus Christ, sell everything that you have and become poor, because only the poor are welcome in the kingdom of God. He doesn't say that. He says, those that are wealthy are welcome in the church. The the, the ground is level at the foot of the cross. Wealthy and poor both come. But those that are wealthy, command them to be good, to be rich in good works. Don't be haughty. Don't be arrogant. Don't put their faith in the uncertainty of riches. And so he's saying you're, you're most welcome, but... If you've been given this great wealth, there's a great responsibility for that wealth. So it would be wrong to say that as we approach the text, that James is saying that all wealthy are going to be judged with weeping at the return of Christ. That would be a wrong understanding of this for sure. God calls uh, rich and poor together and those in the middle unto himself. In Christ, Uh, There's not this social barrier or social status that the world celebrates, uh, but the ground is level at the foot of the cross. In him, there's neither slave or free, a male or female, rich or poor. And so here James is not addressing the rich believer in these first verses, but he's addressing the rich unbeliever who is outside of the church. Now, why do I say that? 
Well, after studying it very carefully, looking at the, the verses that follow, he changes his language and he says, brethren, brethren, brethren. Four times he, he, he addresses those brothers and sisters in Christ with a response. But up until that point, he's saying the rich, the oppressive, those that are outside of the fellowship of the believers, that are, are cruelly treating them, there's a day of wrath coming for you. And, and so as we look at these verses, it's directed towards the, the rich that are unbelieving rich and their oppression of the working poor. Well, with that bit of introduction, <laughs> we go into verse 1. The announcement of the judgment. Come now, you rich, weep and howl for the miseries that are coming upon you. This call to weep and howl that is given is, is saying that there's a day coming when Christ will return, that they will be judged uh, for the, how they have oppressed the poor. A call to weep and howl. Notice in verse 9 of James chapter 5, uh, James says, Behold, the judge is standing at the door. Now, what does that mean? This is Christ. Jesus is the judge. He's standing at the door of heaven, ready to return again, his second coming back to the world, and, and to judge the living and the dead. So get ready. He's, he's there. He's at the door, ready to come at any moment. He'll judge the oppressive rich of uh, that generation and every subsequent uh, uh, generation. Now, the Greek word here used by James for weep and how bitterly is, is used also in the Septuagint in the Greek translation of by the Old Testament prophet Amos. And he says this, the songs of the temple shall become wailings in that day, declares the Lord God. The many dead bodies that are thrown everywhere. Silence, hear this, you who trample on the needy, bring the poor out of the land to an end. Back in Amos's day, God says to his prophet, those rich that are oppressing the poor will be held accountable, held accountable for what they have done. And so there will be this time of weeping and wailing and a, a deep, a deep uh, mourning. Well, God promises those who trample on the poor and the needy and speak of the poor and the needy and speak of nations that would be poor and needy in derogatory terms will be judged, will be judged by Jesus Christ when he comes again and says, I will not tolerate this. This is wrong behavior. This is sinful behavior. And Jesus Christ will judge those that that do these various things. Well, Jesus warns uh, of the nations of this time of bitter mourning of, at his return. He ret in fact, he warns the Jewish people of his day of the time when the Son of Man, the Lord of glory, will come. And there's a, an artist uh, picture there of summing someone that is filled with deep mourning. Then will appear in heaven the sign of the Son of Man. Then all the tribes of the earth will mourn. They'll see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. He'll send out his angels with a loud trumpet call to gather the elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. This is what Jesus says about the second coming. So the day of Christ's return is not going to be a universal day of joy for everybody. It won't. For those that are believers, that are ready to meet the Lord, those that are, are ready to receive him, it'll be a day of great joy and anticipation, a day that you long for. But for those that are not ready, for those that have hardened their hearts against God, and for those that uh, have victimized, particularly here uh, in, the, in our passage for today, the poor and the needy, there will be a day of great reckoning that will come. Well, James continues in verses 2 and 3. He gives the description of the pending judgment upon the oppressive, unbelieving rich. Your riches have rotted. Your garments are moth-eaten. Your gold and silver have corroded. Their corrosion will be the evidence against you. You'll eat your flesh like fire. You've laid up treasures in the last days. Now, that's probably not a message you hear preached from pulpits very often today. Would you agree with that? 
In fact, if you had a steady diet of that, there would probably be a, a lot fewer of you here next week if that was every week you'd hear a message like that. And yet it is truly God's word just as much as the rest of Scripture is God's word, and he's calling uh, them. And he says this, well, what is the description of the judgment? Well, one, their material wealth has rotted, is corrupted. Their garments are moth-eaten. Imagine now, they have all this wonderful clothing in their wardrobe. It was a sign of great wealth to have all this clothing. While those that were very poor were dressed in rags. And they say, well, that's their problem. That's their problem if they're dressed in rags. I've got my nice clothing to wear, and I worked hard for it. So that's the way it is. It, I can't help it. Well, they could have helped it. They could have done something for the poor instead of just accumulating all their wealth and, and, and wearing their wealth. And then he, so he says, now the garments are moth-eaten. In other words, they become worthless at the return of Christ. It didn't help them. Their gold and silver has corroded, become worthless. Uh, now one version says it has rusted. And I said, no, wait a minute. There's a, there's a problem here. Silver and gold doesn't rust. What is going on by saying that this? Here's, a, here's an error in the scripture, all right? Well, don't be so quick to, 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 to say that that is the case. Because certainly if it is literal, if it is a literal understanding, they, they had coinage of the day that there was an alloy of iron mixed together with silver, gold, and their coinage, and as they would b bank that up, uh, it act can, could actually rust uh, because of the impurities there in that. Well, I don't think he's speaking literally. He could, he could be, but I think it's more figurative saying that all that you put your trust in in your money will become worthless when, when Christ returns. It will not help you when it comes to eternal security nor entrance into the kingdom of God. Well, he goes on further and says, the flesh will be eaten like fire. In other words, not only their material wealth will become worthless, but there will be personal doom for them as well. Speaking not, tragically here of the doom of eternity and the fires of perdition prepared for the devil and his angels. You see, the, the language here is the language of the prophet Amos and, and Malachi and, and others that, that clearly spoke against the excesses of, of, of cruelty in, in, with wealth and how that the wealthy would oppress the people. Now, the, the, the believers at this time in the first century, many of them were having their houses taken away from them. Many of them were, were working in these jobs, and then their wealthy uh, employers said, I'm not going to pay you. What are you going to do about that? Defrauded them of that. And then they would go on and have benefits and say, you're not going to get those benefits. What are you going to do? Fight me. Take me to court. Well, how could someone with very uh, modest means go to court and win against someone who is powerful, well-connected, and had all of this and says, well, good luck with that. And so now the people in the church are saying, yes, yes, they're reading this, and this is what's going to happen to the wealthy. I'm with you. I'm with you. And, and they're reading this from James. and said, preach it, James. Preach it. But then he comes, he says, now you who are being oppressed, you are being victimized. This is how you are to respond to that. He went, oh, 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 wait a minute. I have, I, there's supposed to be a godly response to this? Oh, yes. There will be patience. Patience. There will be perseverance. There will be looking to God, looking to the second coming of Christ. And it goes on, and we'll look at that second part next week in more detail. But now we see that there's, their flesh will be eaten like fire. And then he goes on to this evidence for the prosecuting judge, and he, and he speaks about hoarding and selfishness, and indifference to the poor, and these were, these were uh, what the judge would bring against the, the wealthy that oppressed the poor. Now the charges in the judgment, verses 4 to 6. 
Look at, look at the text. Behold, the wages of the laborers who mowed your fields, which you kept back by fraud, are crying out against you. The cries of the harvesters have reached the ears of the Lord of hosts. You've lived down on the earth in luxury and self-indulgence. You've fatted your hearts in the day of slaughter. You've condemned and murdered the righteous person. He does not resist you. And so the, the charges are being laid out here against these oppressive rich. They defrauded the poor of their wages, verse 4. They're self-indulgent, verse 5. They're violent against the righteous. Now, certainly it could be certainly putting them in prison. It could be executing them. Uh, or it could be by slow starvation of poverty. All right, you may not die all at once but will take away uh, your, your resources and slowly you will die. And so they're guilty of the violence against the righteous. And so God sees all of this. He sees the way people are treated. He sees the way nations are treated. He sees the way the church responds to the poor and the needy in the world. And he will judge us for that. He'll judge the world. It's important. Well, now the exhortation to the afflicted, verse 7 to 9. We'll look at this a little bit and then more detail next week. Now you who are afflicted, be patient, therefore, brothers, until the coming of the Lord. See how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth, being patient about it till it receives the early and the late rains. You also be patient. Establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord is at hand. Do not grumble against one another. Brothers, so you may not be judged. Behold, the judge is standing at the door. Four times in verses 7 to 12, James used the word adelphos, uh, or brethren. And he's saying, now, brethren, the brothers and sisters in the church, in the believing community, this is how you are to respond. Uh, a brethren called, first of all, to patience. Patience in view of the coming of Jesus Christ. The very ones who are being afflicted by the oppressive rich, he calls them to patience. And then he says the late rains will come sent from the Lord. Now we'll look at this in more detail next week, but certainly the late rains came. The, the farmer uh, received the early rains and the late rains. And many commentators believe this refers to the Holy Spirit Coming down, upon, uh, coming down upon the world, and there will be this blessing of God poured out his spirit upon the world with great revival and uh, before the second coming of Jesus Christ. In other words, before Christ returns, there'll be a great moving of the spirit around the world. And uh, some people say that's, there's already many signs of that. Uh, last night, I was at a retirement party for one of our missionaries um, uh, from uh, the Emmanuel Gospel Center, and uh, Steve Damon. And Steve Damon wrote, uh, studied a, a book about the quiet revival in Boston. And he, and he studied and wrote much there. And he says, you know, many people thought for years that God isn't working in Boston. And then he did the research and, and, he, and he went to all the churches and worked with the staff and said, you know, there's a great revival. It's a quiet revival. But the Spirit of God is moving in Boston. Lives are being changed and being transformed by Jesus Christ. Well, before Christ comes, there'll be these revivals that take place like that. Revivals in, in China today, in South America, other parts of the world, that God's Spirit is moving in great power. People are coming to himself uh, before he comes because he desires all people to, re to be saved, all people to repent and, and to receive it before he comes again. Well, there's this coming day of these latter rains before the coming of the Lord. And then there's this call not to grumble, for the judge Jesus is standing at the door ready to return. He calls the church body not to grumble. Uh, when, when you're being victimized or oppressed, it's hard not to grumble. It's like, this just isn't fair. This isn't right. I should be paid. Isn't it right I'm losing my home? It's not right they're raising the rent again and again. 
It's not right that, that I can't get this and I can't get that. I can't feed my kids. It's, it's wrong. There's something morally wrong about it. And there's something about it that stirs us up to, to an anger, a righteous anger. And here he says, don't grumble. Don't grumble. That takes the, the Holy Spirit to help you not to grumble. He says, because the, Jesus is standing at the door. He's the one that will rectify. He's the one that will bring about uh, a judgment. And he will bring about a, an accountability for those that have victimized others. That's not saying they were not to do anything to actively involve. Certainly other parts of Scripture talk about how that we are, should, should, should be involved but in, the, in our passage for today, it calls us not to grumble. Well, I'll talk more about that next week. But finally, just the final wrap-up about a, a challenge and an invitation. How do we have a faith that works from hearing today's message? Uh, five things. Number one, a faith that works and a faith that does not envy the rich. So don't be looking at your pocketbook and say, you know, if I had a half a million or I had a million or I had two million or I had five, I had a billion, boy, things would be just so great. It would be all, all my problems be over. I envy those who, who have that. No, 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 no. Don't envy the rich. Put your faith in action. D. Edmund uh, Hebert said this about faith. Faith is not merely a body of doctrinal truth to which we must adhere to, but rather the wholehearted attitude of a full and unquestioning commitment to and dependence upon God as he revealed himself to us in Jesus Christ. Faith. That is faith in action. It's the proper response to the grace, love, and goodness of God. A faith that works, secondly, is a faith that looks at all that God has blessed you with, both great and small, and says, how can I make a difference in the lives of the poor and the oppressed? Those that are facing injustice. How can I, if an employer, care well for my workers? I don't want to defraud them of their wages and their benefits. How can I do a better job as an employer? How can I use what God's given me to make a difference in the world? That's putting your faith into action. Or thirdly, a faith that works is a faith that lives each day looking for the return of Jesus Christ, his gathering of the elect unto himself, and is judging the world in truth and righteousness. Perhaps today Jesus is coming. Are you looking to him? Are you looking for the return of Christ? He's standing at the door, ready to return. Are you looking for his return? If you are, you're putting your faith into action. You're putting your faith to work. I'm living like today may be the day of his coming, or it may be the day of his calling. Maybe you and I won't be here when Christ comes again. But each one of you will be here when Christ calls upon you. Maybe it's sort of an accident that you die, an illness that you face. Each one of you, Christ will call upon you and you will meet him face to face. Well, fourthly, a faith that works is a faith which takes heed to the warnings given in scripture and repents before the day of the Lord's coming. It'll be too late when he comes again for those that have hardened their hearts against him. It'll be a day of weeping and, and mourning and deeply wailing. So today is the day of salvation. Today is the day to repent. And finally, a faith that works is the faith which shows forth patience while suffering injustice in your life and perseverance, not grumbling against others. Well, let's join together in prayer and we have a unison prayer prepared for you uh, in your bulletin. If you would like to join us as we pray, and the, uh, please do so at this time. Let us pray. We draw near to you in prayer, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Turn our eyes upon you as we look for your imminent return. Come quickly, Lord Jesus, right the wrongs done upon the oppressed and the victimized. May we not envy those suffering.
selfish and oppressive rich who hoard and accumulate great wealth, living lives of indifference to the poor and lives of self-indulgence. In loving God, we pray for their repentance before it is too late. Grant us patience and perseverance in living our lives, being wise stewards of all that you have entrusted to us as we seek first your kingdom and care for others, and as we look forward to the day of the Lord when you will return to this earth, judging the living and the dead. It's in your mighty name, Lord Jesus, that we pray.
Excellent job. And that final song that they just sang and led us in about, on Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. Is that the rock you're standing on? Are you standing on Christ? Are you putting your hope in his finished work on the cross? If you are, you're standing on firm ground. If you're not, let's, let's get that right. Let's get that right. Come up and meet with me. We'll have a talk. We'll talk and, and talk about some of your questions. And uh, together we can find the answers through God's word. Just come and we'll have a talk. We'll meet over there. And your family will wait. I'm sure they love you. They're not going to leave without you. All right? And uh, is that true? You guys love, you, love your family? All right? All right, not going to leave. Good, good. So come see me. One of the elders will be at the door to greet you as you go. And, uh, you know, if you see someone that you haven't met before, be bold. Introduce yourself. And if you met them four times before, humble yourself. Say, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. We've met together for the fifth time. Uh, maybe I'll get it right the next time. Well, I can receive this final word as we dismiss from the book of Hebrews. And therefore, fix your eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame, sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinful men, so you not grow weary and lose heart. So consider Christ and know that he is soon to come again. He's returning. He's standing at the door. Until he comes or until he calls, go forth trusting in him as Savior and Lord. Amen.